Okay. So I'll go through. I'll, I'm going to go because we're not that much time and I want to get to the end. I will skim through, but please interrupt me. First of all, I collected a lot of links here. I, there's probably not every blog post, certainly not every blog post written on specialization, but it's a lot of the key ones on the original RFC. And oh, actually, something I wanted to write in. There's basically in reviewing this stuff, I found, you know, there's a few what I would call, un, I don't know what the right word is. They're not exactly unknowns or like future things or something. A um, few places where the design is like a little bit uh, less than we might hope. One of them is, uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a second actually. Let's go down first before I do that. Um, but overcoming, uh, let's see, let me just write notes for myself. One of them is that we have a somewhat simplistic notion of tree-like specialization. This is considered a conservative start. It's not a problem exactly, but um, it's just true. Uh, and I'll explain more what I mean by that in a second. And the other is the soundness around lifetimes, which is uh, what I think is more important at the, at the moment. Um, yes, thank you, Central. I wanted to add that in there. So, right, so the key idea, I guess we all kind of have this idea, but that normally we don't permit overlapping impulse, but specialization does. Um, as long as one of them is more specific. And this is another key point that we discussed recently, that if the item, there's two conditions. You can have two impulse that both supply a value for some function, for some associated type, for some associated item. And the problem would be then that now you have two choices, you have to pick which one. And so we require that one, that one impulse is clearly more specific than the other. And the other is that uh, the less specific impulse has been indicated with default. And the idea here is that essentially, if you don't see the default keyword, then you know that the value in the impulse applies. Um, and if you do see the input, the default keyword, and you know locally that the value might not apply if there's a more specific one to be found. What we don't require you to signal at the moment is there's no indication that you are overriding somebody else. Just, it's just so. Um, as some languages like Java or whatever do or have been moving towards. Um, the main motivation probably, uh, there's kind of three listed in the RFC more or less. Performance is probably the single most common one. It's being able to take some default, some implementation that's correct but inefficient and then give, or potentially inefficient, and then give more efficient variations. But the same thing applies for kind of um, ergonomics. You might like to have, uh, well, you might like to have things like, one example that we can't add for backwards compatibility reasons, but which is interesting, would be something like, you know, we have the debug and the display traits, and maybe we'd like to say that if you just implement display, you get that for debug, unless you also implement debug, and then you override it. That's not performance exactly, but it's similar in some notion. You get a kind of a quality of life improvement of not having to derive so many things. Right. So you kind of get like an implementation that's pretty good, but probably not as good as it can be, and then you can make it better. Right. In that sense, it's similar. Um, but coming back to performance, this is kind of important. There's, or I, oh, oh, not come back to performance. One other thing is, the other the other concept in the RFC is improving. This is sort of a subtle point. Improving how we handle defaults. Right. So today we have this notion of a trait. They can have default, or you don't write default in the trait, but you can have functions with default implementations. And the idea is the impl will use that if um, you don't give a if you don't override it. Well, that gets kind of generalized in this RFC so that it's like you can provide more than one set of defaults and they can be more narrow, right? So that, but that code above would sort of be equivalent to, um, to this in the RFC. Uh, so that the idea of a default impulse is basically, it's an impl. it's not an impl in the sense that it doesn't fully implement the trait. It's like, uh, it contains defaults that can be used by other impulse. Um, and so, yeah, that's correct. Uh, and so that can be useful. So you might, I don't know if this is a realistic example, but you might say, if you have some skippable thing, you know, if you're also random access, then you can jump ahead. Um, 
in, in a more efficient way, and that's what you'll get. Um, so the main thing is that there's sort of two, or coming back to the idea of being more specific, there are kind of two ways to be more specific. One is that you have more specific types. So here we might say, okay, this is the trait that's, that's used when you call extend. Uh, and it can, we can define it in general for all iterators, but then we can make a more specific one for slices where we can use mem copy or whatever. Um, I think I might need to have you copy here or something. I don't know, but let's leave it out, leave it out for now. Um, and then for the other thing, which would also be useful is to be able to narrow by traits. So here I, I said, yeah, all iterators, but iterators that also implement trusted len. I could be more efficient in that case, let's say. Um, and these, this turns out to be a pretty important distinction for soundness. Uh, and you can kind of combine them a little bit. You could have an impl that both has more specific on types and on traits and so on. Um, so does that all make sense so far? That was definitely- Makes sense so far, yeah. Pretty fast, but okay. Um, so it's worth talking a little bit about what happens during compilation because it's relevant. And this is where the soundness sort of problems come from. Um, so in the type checker today, we have, or in the compiler today, we have kind of two, at least two, but two main phases. Um, so is there's- this, uh, Quick question, is this done doing in the Rusty type check case? Is what done? This is what I'm about type to talk about? Type yeah, checking? Type checking. Uh, yes, not exclusively, but it is done there. Um, there's really kind of two modes, essentially. You're, the type checking mode, which is what, when you're doing the main type check, also occurs during bar check, for example. Um, and in that case, uh, the idea is we're checking the generic functions for correctness. Um, and, and we're actually computing the, all the lifetimes and other information as we do it, uh, right? So it's like a full compilation. And in that case, we don't, we don't have a problem if we're in this mode. We don't really have a problem with um, the full range of impulse that we can have. So in other words, if you, you can have impulse like this one that require that something be, in this case, it requires that a given reference is tick static, right? And, and that would mean if I were compiling here, um, I might say, I might have a variable, I might call, um, I might call bar with some reference, right? And now, What's going to happen in this type checking phase, we're going to create a inference variable here because we don't know, we have to figure out what the lifetime of Y is. What is the range of code where it needs to be live? And when we call bar, we find out, oh, well, so in this case, the type of T is basically the same as, I'm somewhat simplifying, but it's okay for this purpose. Basically the same as the type of Y. So ampersand tick zero. And we know that T has to implement the trait and the only info we can use for that requires that tick zero is U32. So in order to type check this, we would basically, first we have to show, I'm gonna use chalk notation here, but we have to show that U32 implements the trait. And we figure out that this is true if tick zero is tick static. And so we wind up inferring that tick zero equals tick static, which will give us an error, which in turn triggers an error here. Um, because that that variable x is not alive uh, for the lifetime tick static. Um, so this this all happens during type checking and, and we're fine with that. So the problem is when we get into trans, we're gonna we have to we're gonna do we're gonna do the monomorphization phase where we, we lay out all the generics and we know all the type information specifically, and at that point we redo type checking because or we redo not all of type checking but we redo certain parts of trait matching to figure out like okay now that we know exactly what types are involved what method should we call, and at that time we don't have the lifetime information. This is for efficiency. It's also because um, otherwise we have to make many many copies 
of uh, like you well, for, uh, of functions like bar that are getting called with with types that have lifetimes in them. But it's also um, it's also not sound to do it because of lifetime parameters too. Yeah, well, this is what makes it not sound, I guess, in part. Um, but right, so we don't know what the lifetimes are, so we can't figure out in short. Does this trait apply or not? Because all we know is that there's a reference for some lifetime. But we don't know what that lifetime is. Um, and that's where the soundness hole comes in. Because now, uh, now we have we might have something like. Um, we might have a specialization where we say we have one trait. Let's see. These are not the best names in the world, but we have a specialization where we say here's one impl and here's another one, but only if it implements the trait. And we can't tell whether this applies or not, basically. Um, and that's kind of the root of our problem. Uh, and it can show up in a lot of ways. So like here, it was pretty obvious because I just wrote tick static. But actually, if we look a little bit lower, we'll see there's some other examples. Like, first of all, I could have had a tick static bound. Or even something like this case, where there's no lifetimes at all, actually violates these rules. Because here I said, any pair of types, as long as they're the same type. So if I had two references, I would have to know that their lifetimes are the same, but if I don't know what their lifetimes are, I can't know if they're the same. Um, One question here. Um, are you suggesting that you can or cannot specialize on specific? Is yep. it Mike is, uh, right, yeah. can write a lifetime and and uh, uh, checking or can you uh, you're gonna have to try that again Josh I haven't heard a thing you said Specify a trait, uh, sorry, specify a lifetime and have that checked. I mean, is it checked or is it actually affecting inference? Okay. So I, I didn't hear everything but the last half sentence of what you said, but I think I have a guess uh, of what you were asking. Um, you were, let me take a guess. Were you, you were asking, actually, I don't really know, but what you, the last thing you said was, is it checked or is it influencing inference? Um, and the answer yeah. is, the answer is during type checking, um, it's a little bit of both kind of, but we're taking this constraint into account basically. So we are influencing inference and figuring out if we can satisfy it. And then, you know, doing so if we can uh, by choosing types that satisfy it, which might then lead to borrow check errors or, or errors in later phases of the compiler. Um, but you know, we're taking it into account and the key idea is we, we figure out during type checking, we know that this constraint will be satisfied for all the types that this function is used with, right? Every time. So this might be a generic function, but we'll, we'll figure out that for whatever T this is called with all the lifetime constraints are met that occur inside the body. They, they don't create errors. And so then when we're actually at trans time, and we're monomorphizing for specific types. We don't have to prove that again because it's already been proven for us. In the same way that we know that the traits are implemented in general and the methods must be available and so on. Does that make sense? That made sense, yes, thank you. Um, I was trying to get, I was trying to figure out in more detail because it seems like this is so closely related to the soundness hole regarding lifetime, so I wanted to understand better how lifetimes interacted with specialization and that helped. Thank you. So one of the most insidious parts of this thing I'll point out is that um, 
the problem is often not like local or it doesn't have to be local. So if you hear in all these cases, I kind of wrote the implementations of the trait which fail to be parametric directly, but you can also have some that fail to be, if they ultimately depend on lifetimes, but indirectly, right? So here it does, uh, this the dependency comes from some other trait number, um, which creates a bunch of pain when you sort of try to solve this in any local way. The tuple thing is probably not that common. Well, um, not tuple specifically, but... Yeah, it can uh, come up in other ways too. Two, two times. Like this would, this is obviously some other trait, I guess, because it has right. a different... Thing. Yeah, this, yeah, this seems much more common. Any time that the, the type parameters are kind of repeated. But one thing that's important is that it doesn't apply to a case like this. Uh, which is to say, we don't care about what appears inside the impl body. We only care about the impl header, right? Put and that so, okay up with the impl. Put that okay up higher. It needs to be more prominent. Yeah, you're right. Um, so this seems really important and I'd like to understand better. You're saying that in this case, if you were to, if A includes some manner of lifetime, then there is no enforcement that the for A and the output equals A have the same lifetime? There's no enforcement at trans time, like when we're generating code, but we don't need to enforce it because the type checker already proved it. And the important point would be that we know um, that that the, 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 what comes inside the impl body doesn't affect which impl we use. Is sort of what it comes down to. So, like we will, so we'll be able to figure out that this impl applies. Okay, oh. so it can't affect impl selection, but it will not in any way uh, be unchecked. It will always actually be checked if there is a lifetime constraint there. Yeah, and the reason I bring this up is that the distinction, like this is, we, we were, I would typically call these input types that appear in the impl header, and these are output types, the associated types. Okay. And there's a kind of flexibility in how you choose to model your trait. Sometimes people prefer to put the, uh, put things all in the impl header, and sometimes they use associated types, and the distinction matters a lot for, for this purpose. Um, like you really want to use associated types when it makes sense. Um, um, a small note that if you have, if you add a bound on the, if you like add a bound on, on the output and you mention a, um, then, then that is actually part of the signature. It's the same thing as having a weird clause. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Yes, but I'm not sure that it has to be. It certainly isn't the way the compiler models it um, today. Wait, you're saying but, if you have type output colon some other trait, then that's considered a constraint as if it were in the header rather than something if, that no, that's, the not, that's not that's not actually true. Are you uh, central? Are you talking talking about the hyperlow case where the trait two's definition has that bound on so the output you, associated type? Right, so you don't, A, you don't put those bounds in impulse today, although with GATS you would, but, or you could, but, um. Oh, sorry, yeah, the. But, no. Yeah, that, yeah. that sorry, yes, that, that's a bound on the, it's not possible to put a bound on, on the, uh, on the impulse, sorry. Yes. In, in, in Got the it. Type of the impulse. Okay, yes. thank you. And, right, and even, even the bounds here, actually, it's true that in the compiler's desugaring, Presently, we convert this to to a format like that. Yeah. Uh, however, I don't think that's actually a necessary thing to do. Um, I don't know. I have to think about it. Well, it makes the model model of the language simpler. Simpler. Actually, I, I think it's actually makes it more complicated. But I've come to think over time. But uh, it depends on your point of view. With GATS, it doesn't always work quite as well. As, I don't know. Mm, yeah. But it's. It's a, it's a good point. It's a, it might be the case that, well, in any case, let me take that back. It's true that we do that, but it's not relevant to this question because those yes. don't wind up as where clauses on this symbol. 
Um, right. So they're just things that the impl itself has to prove, essentially. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we've thought a lot about this problem, and we've been debating for a long time how to solve it. The, the RFC has one sort of sketch of an idea that doesn't really work out that well. Uh, and when you Although say this problem here, you're just talking about correct specialization in general? Talking about the lifetime dispatch problem. So in particular, how can we kind of allow the use cases we wanted to allow with specialization while also having the impulse that people can write and, uh, and retain soundness? Maybe I should show where it becomes unsound. Um, Right. This is what I was getting at is that uh, before we go into, we've thought a lot about the lifetime problem. It seems like now we have enough background to try to talk through the lifetime problem. Time check. 33 minutes. In. Yeah. Well, I mean, you remember perhaps from like when we were talking about uh, DIN trait soundness and so on, the main, the main problem has to do with at least in the way the language works today, with uh, with associated type projection, basically. Um, so, if we if we had some impl like this, you have a blanket impl of something for every type. Right. Okay. So, so now we have this trait. And now the question is, what is the value of, of this when you don't know what this lifetime is? I see. Um, and so the problem is, what comes down to the problem here is that the, yeah, the, trans, the, the trans code just can't answer this question. It doesn't know what the lifetime is. And the type checker might wind up with one of two answers. There, there's like... The type checker might wind up with uh, one of two answers depending on how much it knows about that lifetime. Uh, so like if you had, uh, the type checker would be, okay, the type checker would be conservatively correct, but um, like if you're in a context think, like yeah. this, it might not know, you know, it, it would wind up, it, it would not be sure whether this impl applies or not. So it would be conservative because it would fall back to this generic impl and see the default and it would know that there might exist a specialization. Um, but the, if you- the recovering half players in the room, this is starting to sound like some of the problems that can come up when you're dealing with uh, overlapping instances and undecidable instances. Like in Haskell? Yeah, That's sure. what I just said, yes. Um, so it would be conservative here. I think there are ways, I have to look, but well, the bottom line is, of course, if, uh, you know, if you did happen to have um, uh, a tick static where it, the type checker does know, or a reference where it does know that it's tick static, then it would, it would uh, pick U16. So what I'm trying to say is it, it's not like the type checker could pick reasonably so sort of either one, so it's not like we can, um, right, but it's it, not it, like trans can pick one way. If it knows, if it knows that it's tick static, it would, it could pick U16, but if it doesn't know what the, re uh, what the region is, then it should uh, not normalize the type. Yeah, it would have to leave it abstract, yeah. But, right. but nonetheless, you don't want to just, so the only, like trans could always pick U16 in some sense, but that's clearly wrong because it might not be static. Um, Moreover, there's another sort of subtler point here. A lot of times people, when this is raised, they, they ask like, why not? Maybe we, we don't want to differentiate between all lifetimes, but maybe we can make tick static special and, and choose and sort of monomorphize twice, once for static lifetimes and once for non-static. And that's the only thing that we track, uh, which would at least allow the type checker or at least allow trans to make a decision in some sense. But that that doesn't, really work. For one thing, it doesn't solve the equality problems that we mentioned earlier. And for another thing, at least right now, the type checker kind of randomly pick, not randomly, it picks the smallest lifetimes it can that meet the constraints that it sees. And now there's a sort of a choice. Like if it, if you had a function where you had 
um, you had something where it can be static, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like this, then, uh, then there is a kind of choice the type checker is making about, is this going to be tick static because it came from static data? Or is it going to be less because it's not used in a, in a scope where static is required? And it, right now we'll pick less, but in that case, we will be choosing what associated type you get here. And it's just kind of arbitrary and not easily explained. Um, and you really don't want us to pick the largest lifetime because that will produce all kinds of bogus, that doesn't even make sense. Um, it will produce lots of borrow check errors. So, uh, so there's a kind of ambiguity where type checker has freedom of what lifetime to pick and it currently <coughs> smaller. I guess the bottom line is we don't want to expose <laughs> just that if, if we had exposed information like this, that would have prevented us from doing NLL. It would prevent us from making future improvements. We want to keep the type checkers freedom here to make choices. Um, so, so we really don't want to depend on the lifetime dispatch. Does that help, Josh? This, this does make sense. It's it's unfortunate given that I can very easily imagine cases where somebody would want to specialize for, say, uh, reference to tick static stir versus reference to non static stir. Uh, but at the same time, if that were simply a documented limitation of uh, stable specialization, it wouldn't be the end of the world that you're not allowed to specialize on lifetime. Yeah, that would. The specializing in lifetime is, is is like that violates parametricity and is completely yeah. backwards and incompatible. You you can certainly help imagine why people would want it, but unfortunately, it's sure. it's sure. not tenable. It's um, not possible. Well, very precisely, I can imagine why people would want to specialize on tick static in particular because there are things you can do with a static stir that you can't do yeah. with a non-static stir. Definitely. Yeah, we would need. Yeah, I can definitely see them. See why that would be useful in some sort of um, and at the same time, if we're simply like we can't probably do this, then so be it. Right. So okay. So the solution that we have to make this sound, um, the Although, first, if I might oh. might might inject, um, what you could do is like new type wrap your uh, yes. static versus not static and and sort of. Dispatch on, on that type instead, possibly. Yeah, that's right. If you really wanted to specialize on static stir, well, you can't, but you can have other types. Uh, like if it's if you have total control of the project, <laughs> you know, you could imagine that you have some type like static string. Uh, shoot, and then your your constant is actually a static string struct. Um, and then you can specialize on that. Uh, okay. Effectively pull it out of parameterization and into a concrete type and then you're fine? Yes. Yep. That would work like as long as you're not getting these static stirs from other places that are out of your control or I don't know. Right. It would be nice if we came up with a way in the compiler to make that uh, possible to be the type of a tick static stir, but that's a problem for another day. Yes. Well, record transparency you can transmute. But anyways, we digress. Yeah. There might, I don't know if there might be some clever hacks you could even do, but anyway, yes. Uh, so, um, so, right. So now we're coming to the, the meat of it. What, what can we do about this problem? Um, I think the current, oh, and I should add one thing is, we, we are starting to see bugs around this in practice. Uh, people are adding specializations that depend on lifetime parametricity without realizing it, and that's not great um, in the standard library. And in particular, it seems like we have one, the most annoying part is it's not even a performance question. It's actually a, it appears to be part of its behavior, um, which is worse because you can't just rip it out for sure. Uh, you have to find a solution. So. So what was this idea? I think the last time, I think it was after the 2018 all hands or something, um, I wrote this blog post, Always Applicable Impulse. And the core idea was that we only really have problems because when the specialization 
when the impl that is doing the specializing is adding new constraints that the base impl or the types involved in the impl don't already prove for you, right? So um, essentially, uh, as long as you limit yourself, this is what this concept of always applicable means. If, if you, in the simplest version, if you look at the types that the impl applies to and you say, for every instance, any instance of those types, um, this impl is always going to apply, then you don't have a problem. So an example like, well, this was in our motivating examples, an example like specializing to slices of U is okay, as long as you're specializing to all possible slices. Um, it would not be okay if you were adding some constraint on U, like it has to be slices of ORD things or slices of copy things. That's not good uh, because, well, copy might be a little bit special, but um, it's not presently actually. That's not good because somebody could implement copy for my type of antic static, for example, and that's currently allowed. Uh, although we don't like it when you do that. <laughs> um, there was a sound oh. bug around it. I closed it. Oh, yeah. One second. Interesting. Sorry. Uh, so that's the idea of an always applicable impl. Um, you can extend it slightly, but I'm not gonna, there were a few possible extensions, um, but the key thing is it doesn't handle, you know, this use case that we want to support of like where T is a trusted length. And that's kind of annoying. Um, and in particular, that that's exactly what 67194 was trying to do is to write an impl that's gated on implementing multiple traits and not based on being a specific type. Um, so this is where Aaron's, I guess there were various extensions and Aaron had what may be the most promising one. Um, yeah. I detailed here. Um, I especially, especially like the fact that this sort of make, makes the specialization more visible as well as being flexible. Yes. So what, what this, what this, what this, concept was is currently we have one kind of bound which is like t trait and that says t implements trait right but Aaron proposed adding another kind of bound which I'm just going to write it like this so I think the it is pretty obvious that the syntax and name are not ideal um, and so we'll leave the bike shed aside but <laughs> what what this for the moment what this means is basically t implements trait with an always applicable impl. Um, so it's a subset of the larger, the normal bound, which I've written here in chalk notation. So if you know that specialized T trait, then you know that the trait is implemented, but you don't know the other way around because if you know that it's implemented, you don't know that it was with an always applicable impl. It might be with some other impl. Um, and there's one subtle, maybe it's worth going through some examples because there's a kind of subtle point that I realized in reading the post. It's, I think it's what Aaron intended. <laughs> it's a little bit implied, which is that impulse can actually be kind of three-way. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So imagine that I have, right, I can make an impul that is clearly not, not always applicable or lifetime dependent. We had a bunch of examples above. Um, maybe it references to static, maybe it has the same type parameter twice. Um, and, or I can make an impl that is clearly always okay, which is what the post outlined, always applicable, and it talked about some of the rules for that. But there are also these kind of neutral impuls that are okay if, you could sort of read either way, potentially. So if you just say like, I implement bar as long for all foo types, you could say that, well, when you're trying to test if bar is implemented in a specialized compatible way, then, you will then sort of propagate that to the where clause. So that'll be true if T foo is implemented in a specialized compatible way. Um, and then, so then it ultimately depends on what the base sort of belief impuls are. Are there any, if you enumerate all the impuls out, are there any lifetime dependent impuls in there? Um, or are they all either neutral or lifetime independent? Um, 
And uh, so what it comes down to then is when you're writing a specialization, if you want to add any trait bounds, uh, you would have to use this sort of mode to do so. So you could say, I extend t for all t that are iterator as long as they're trusted len. And it might be even simpler if you had to do it for all trait bounds, period. Um, but it's not strictly necessary. That's kind of the high level presumably, idea. Presumably, write specialized iterated bus Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yes. Um, that's actually a question for me, though, which I would want to come around to of like, can you mix T iterator and specialize, or I don't know what, you know what notation we're going to use, I'm going to write this, um, in a specializing impl, more complex. So the reason that, let me just rewind to make sure. What does mix mean? Uh, can you have both? So basically, I guess it comes down to what are the rules for, for what a specializing impl, when you have a, when you have a specializing impl, what are the exact rules we want to do? Um, is this a question about soundness or, or more? It's more of a question about, uh, it's not a question of soundness. There's like a maximal system we could do. It's a question of how hard is it to implement and how hard is it to explain. Um, and so this is where like the maximally conservative version so is I, the impl so must so be. I, I would like to, I would like to preface that with, um, I think most of the people who would like and who would use specialization for very, for um, a lot would be those who are doing like performance work and building frameworks. Um, and I think those might, those might be the people who can tolerate more complexity. Whereas users of, of those frameworks. Yeah. So let me, um, that might be true. Well, I feel like I haven't really explained very well. I'd be shocked if, pe if people were all following why you could or couldn't mix these two kinds of bounds. So maybe I can give an example uh, to try and make it a little clearer. One of them might be like, imagine that I have, I know this isn't how hash set is defined, but just imagine if it was how hash set is defined, that in the definition of hash set, I specified that all the keys have to be hashable. Um, now I might have some, I might have some impl that is true for all t, and I might have an impl that is true for hash set of k, uh, where k hash. And so the important point is this, this is not a specialized trait bound, right? It's a full normal trait bound. However, I also know that I always know when I write an impl that all my types, all my input types are well formed. Like the person who is using that impl has to prove that already. That's part of the way that the rest type system works. And in that case, I also already know that k implements hash in the full sense because otherwise the type wouldn't be well formed. So I can actually write it here and, it, and it's okay. But if I were, if I were to write k hash plus, let's say ord, I would have to write specialized ord or whatever because that does not follow from my type definition. Um, so that's one case. That's kind of the simpler case. Uh, and then the more complicated case that was part of my list of possible extensions is that you could imagine um, if you're specializing another impl, it might also give you some information. So if we had like, but this is a little, more subtle. Uh, let's let's do tick static. If you had some impl that applied only to tick static types, and then I want to, um, I want to write a specialized version for hash set. Now, well, this k tick static is not implied by the type, but 
um, the type checker is going to guarantee that the conditions on the base impl at minimum have to apply. Um, and so it's just not, it won't be sure whether this, uh, so it's sort of already implied that T must be tick static. And we already have rules in the compiler that say, we, that, that allow us to know that if hash, uh, that if hash set of k is tick static, then k must be tick static. So we could kind of configure this out. Um, I would rather not handle this case for various reasons. But, um, it complexity, but. but it should be, it seems like it would be for impossible to do case, just do case one and then maybe some other time decide that we won't want to do case two, right? That, that's right. Then it seems like a good idea to to only do case one for now. At least, it would be a good I, starting I, point. I, I think, yeah, I think we need to. I think we need to ship something uh, and try try to keep it minimal. Right, but still something that makes sense. Yes, so seven minutes. Um. Right. There might be some simplest version where we just said we're just going to require you to write specialize on everything. Uh, but yeah, that might uh, make, make some sense. And then it's kind of easier to explain. Well, if you're writing a specializing impl, <laughs> but at that point you start to wonder. Well, that seems a little silly to make me write it on every bound. Maybe it should be uh, yeah, but I, something I you write that, on the impl, it. but. I think that's a good idea. Ship something that gives our users um, the thing they want, and then we can try to make it more economic over time. Uh, then we can uh, then we can also base that on user input. Like, how are they? Are a lot of people complaining about? Do I have to? Do I have to write specialize all, all the time? Um, yeah. Then we can think about. One thing I would add. Nicely. One minor thing is if we had implied bounds, which we haven't shipped and we have some outstanding questions around, but if we did, one of the goals for implied bounds was to make it so that bounds like k hash didn't have to be written. In which case, the always applicable rules are kind of nice. It's basically if you don't have any where clauses or all the where clauses are specialized clauses, because uh, all the other stuff follows from implied bounds in the first place. Um, but the one last thing which we said since we're in the last end of the meeting. One observation I had while reviewing this is that we have the notion of always applicable already in the drop check, which may help us both in implementation, but also in explaining things. So you cannot write implement drop for my struct of tick static, for example, for exactly the same reason that, um, that we don't want you to have it in, in specialization, that we won't know whether to run this in trans. Uh, Wait, you mean tick, the definition of my struct there is it should be tick A and not tick static? Yes, sorry. So we've already got the code to do this kind of check is my point. And it's it's relatively simple for the, the case of... It, and um, thinking about the minimal steps to, to move forward right, right now, I think it would be good to add the lint or some sort of enforcement that we can use in this down library um, to at least not um, not add more problematic specializations and like have a have a moratorium on using on adding new specializations until we have that. I agree that that is a good next step. I also think it would allow us to start doing creator runs and test right. and look for like surprises. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, another, another thing um, which feels like the mo uh, like a relevant next step would be to uh, finish uh, associated type defaults and ship those. Um, yeah, we didn't really talk about that at all, but I agree. And I know there's a PR that's, yeah. I know I owed Jonas like a, Mm -hmm. I should mail him some chocolate or something, but uh, <laughs> for it's the very, long delay. It's, the, it's <laughs> very thorough uh, uh, with the tests, I think, at this point, yeah. which is really nice. Nice job on nice job on enumerating those test, test cases, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah. So just in case 
well, I won't, let's not go into detail on what the interactions here are, but yeah. Um, I think another thing would be writing up, in my view, it would be good to revise the specialization RFC and like include this material uh, or try to have, if not the RFC, like maybe not as in the form of RFC, but some kind of, I would like a canonical thing that includes the defaults, this, these concepts and puts it together and I would probably start with the RFC as a starting point. Uh, but um, so that we have a like reference to go to where we say, okay, what is the rules now? Here are the rules. Um, because right now yeah, it I gets think, pretty disjointed. I think this review has uh, definitely added lots of input to that. So yes. It's not that much. I agree. It, we got a lot of the pieces, but. Uh. So I like this idea. Uh, I think the question which we can figure out offline is who or what shall do the lint, but I bet I have some thoughts on that. Uh, it would be good to yeah. mentor it out. For sure. Do you want to do you want to add a comment regarding the uh, moratorium for now? A comment to the the moratorium until we have the lint. But yeah, I can add a comment, but I'm not sure where to put the comment. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's more like maybe. let's ping the libs team or something. Um, yeah, you might want to add a note to the porch as well. Uh, I think they have some section about specialization uh, in in their uh, lips. Okay, to, yeah. Um, section there about specialization. Yep. Yeah, um, let, me, let, let me drop you in. I assume that you're expecting the lint that you want to add here to be simple enough that it's not worth adding a different lint that just flags any specialization and then you know some way to attribute to say I've, I've marked this as allowed. I'm actually not sure. It seems like it seems like the the I mean we could do I mean we could certainly move faster with a lint that flags any specialization and requires us to at least vet them. <laughs> and sort uh, of any says, specialization but, should be I mean you can just correct for default basically. Um, mm -hmm. That tells you the basic. I think that if you flagged literally every sure, specialization yes. and then had to vet that individually, I think you'd find people not so much vetting as placating the compiler. Yeah, but well, I think that's true in the wild. It, it might help in the standard library at least. It, it might. Be a, but, at least it'd be a yeah. review flag that you could could notice. But, but yeah, like I think it would go. It would work only if we also had the guidelines of like like it directs you to an issue and the issue says. Make sure the impl is only for concrete types and doesn't add any trait. Yeah, maybe, probably maybe, maybe that, that could be added to like was type five or something. Um, I guess the question is like how much work? Probably it's worth just looking quickly at the drop check code to see just how hard is it to make the link because that would be better. Um, right. I was sort of hoping that we could filter out the concrete types as part of this, you know, a like the lint that wasn't just a grep, but rather you know, something in the compiler, you should be, I would hope, easily able right. to say, yeah. okay, concrete types are accepted. Well, at some point you're getting kind of close to the actual check. So I guess the question is like, how hard is the actual check compared to that? Because you're worried about like the end of level and direction thing problem that you spoke of up above where, you know, that's why the, a local check doesn't suffice. Is that where you're kind of the case you're worried about here? No, I'm just saying that the local check when you say filter out concrete types, like really you have to look for, you're looking for things like, is it, is the parameter repeated? Like, I think many specializations still have some type parameters, I guess is what I'm saying. Cause they're implemented for hash set of, or for back of T or something. And uh, so it's not enough to say it must be fully concrete. That would be pretty strict. Um, so you could do that. You would, but if you're then starting to write anything more than that, then maybe it's easier to just extract the code we have that exists. That's all I'm saying. But, but at least um, for now, like people are adding more specializations to the standard and it's under the so it should probably right. Right. But we should, what we shouldn't do is stall for a long time <laughs> on getting the perfect thing, I think. But if we can, we should figure out what we can get in a reasonable amount of time. Let's just discuss this 
this is like an engineering question. I think we should discuss it afterwards. Um, sure. That in the last, like before we close the call, I'm more curious to know whether, I guess there were lingering questions about meaning or design that we could discuss. But. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't understand the specialized predicate because from what was presented here, I don't exactly understand what that adds over the impulse that you, 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 you know, you described it as being different in terms of, you know, a directionality in the uh, implication, but I don't actually understand why that is. No, I don't understand what it means. Yeah. Like, okay. so let me give you an example. That's very concrete. Uh, going over to this bug that came up in practice. Um, right. There's this partial EQ, there it is, or partial ORD. So if we have here this version, right, where you have, you're specializing for K as long as K is ORD, but not all ORDs, just specialized ORD. And then there's this impl. This impl says, uh, requires the same, uses the same tick A twice, right? So based on the simple, we can say that it's implemented, but it is not specialized. Derive what that, what you conclude is specialized, that it filters out, filters out these cases. Okay, when, yeah. and presumably it's all the cases you described above, I'm just not quite 100% clear what the definition would be, but I understand the, the goals at least I understand. Yeah, I didn't have quite time to dive into the exact details, but. Yeah, that's the idea is to you sort of screen out, which means you might get, I mean, it will be potentially, you could imagine being surprised, it's certainly potentially surprising that if you don't really know what this means, you're just kind of think it's like a variation on ORD and you're like, well, why isn't this triggering? My type is ORD. And the reason is that your type is only sometimes ORD depending on lifetimes, right? Um, right. Yeah, we might need to have a way to specify that like an implementation is intended to be specialized, right? Like some sort of attribute or something away from some assert like, my yes. intention is that this be that way, and then that way future changes will be, you know. Which gets to the, a question I wanted to bring up, but we didn't get to, but I'll just plant the seed, is that, you know, we're talking about addition changes and so on. I think it's plausible to imagine, like, starting to lend, it doesn't really have to be tied to the addition even necessarily, trying to warn people about impulse that would be screened out and require them to be marked in some way. Uh, that's something I would only want to, it'd be hard to know without measuring how often they occur, but, uh, I think we could start to think about, you could certainly imagine warnings that say, we chose not to apply this specialization because this impl didn't meet the criteria. Like uh, that is, but that's going to occur at the use site, which is suboptimal, but yeah, but still maybe useful. I don't know. Getting this, getting the spans right. Uh, one other interesting question would be, yeah, I think I'm, the way I'm thinking of it is, and I think it's probably the only way, is that you're doing all these checks generically, uh, like pre-monomorphization. Though there is a world where you say, okay, <laughs> like if you had an impl that says, if a trans time T is U32, you could sort of consider this simple, but I think that's going to go into, I'm not even going to, I take it back. Don't forget I said that. I'm sure that will lead to bad, to some of us on this full. <laughs> the whole goal is to be like, obviously reasonable. That is not obvious. Uh, so yeah, there, that would be the, the idea. And there is some potential for confusion that we would have to think about how to uh, mitigate. If The main change from what the RFC says and what this is, is basically that you have to write specialize, which as Central pointed out, like at least there's a keyword in there that you can be like, what is happening? Right. <laughs> uh, maybe that's yeah. because of my confusion. And then you look right. it up and you understand to understand the rules. I actually, maybe. I, actually don't, I actually don't mind the concrete syntax of this. Right. I mean, if it's going to change the semantics, I think it's good. That you, you, won't, you know me, Nico. I, I want to have variant sanitation, so I'm not going to object to this. Um, but I, I do think that I will. I can imagine some people saying, "Why don't we just infer it?" Which is what the RFC, I guess, said. Like, right? You yeah, should be able to figure out which which bounds are mm -hmm. introduced, and then do the same thing. But it, then that's bad error messaging. You sort of this, could, but 
It but this be. specialized would be usable in in like it doesn't have to be in an input, right? It could be anywhere a bound is a bound. It would, yeah. You could put it anywhere. Um, I mean, if we allow it to be anywhere, there's no reason we shouldn't. Let's put it that way. Right. Uh, but is that meaningful? Mm. When it would be useful, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe simpler, probably simplest to just allow it, and, like not use it. Yeah, I would. I would default to allowing it just because that's like just less. Otherwise, we're sort of screening out where clauses in random ways for arbitrary reasons. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be hard to check. You would just traverse the uh, AST and AST validation to remove uh, and like error. Yeah, but it's not hard. It's just not why? easily explained why. <laughs> um, I think the main variation that I'm somewhat like, I'm not in. I think there is some, I see some value to writing that you're declaring that you're specializing and then that having, instead of writing it on all the bounds, mm -hmm. it just seems a little easier to explain what's happening. But are you <laughs> imagine that as an, as an extra syntax or you imagine that as being the only syntax because then it's an expressiveness issue, right? That's right. I don't know. Okay. I imagine it, I mean, I, I, that was kind of why I brought up this question of should we allow mixing and stuff? Uh, it's exactly that because if you put yeah, we don't it know enough level, yet. yeah, we'll find out. I I guess at minimum I don't like this keyword in this location because it doesn't. It's okay. It's just very. It doesn't carry any intuition for me. Uh, it would be easy to parse at least. I mean. Yes, I would like a name that carried some intuition. If we could come up with. So, mm. Don't worry about that right now. We got bigger problems. All right. Well, I'm glad we did the meeting. It proved productive, I think. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Let's let Felix go out of the cold.